the most important um, thing uh, I think about fighting air pollution is to think of the air as one air. So a combination of local air pollution and greenhouse gases. What we need is zero air emissions. You know, that is what we need to protect public health, protect the environment and protect the climate. Well, basically I started campaigning about traffic um, in local streets near here and we persuaded, we took the government to court um, and we were successful, but uh, what we found is there's no point trying to persuade politicians to do things they don't want to do and don't have to do. Uh, and we discovered that air pollution is very bad around here and so I started campaigning on that 16 years ago and it's been a very successful campaign at reducing air pollution, not just around here, but across the whole of London. Well, air pollution is the world's largest environmental health risk, killing an estimated seven million people every year. And that picture is no different in the UK. So we have about 35,000 deaths every year uh, from air pollution. And what we're talking about here is two types of local air pollution. There are particles, uh, so-called PM2.5 or PM10 that you'll have heard of, which are regulated as a cloud for health or legal purposes. And the other type of local air pollution is um, uh, are the gases. And it's really one type of gas, which is the uh, one which gets the headlines, which is nitrogen dioxide and that's a toxic gas uh, from combustion. So in a city like London, uh, levels of particles, PM2.5, might be around, say, 10 micrograms per cubic meter, and that would compare with, say, 20 in Seoul, uh, for example. Uh, and in terms of the gases, nitrogen dioxide, around these streets might be 30 to 40 micrograms per cubic meter, and that's probably that not much different, not much different to in Seoul. Um, uh, but so, you know, your particle levels are higher, uh, but we both share a problem with these combustion gases. Well, um, Ella Roberta Adukissi Deborah um, died aged nine uh, from asthma and we found out afterwards from exposure to air pollution. Uh, it was a very, very tragic story, many visits to the hospital, um, a very caring mother, um, and, and a really terrible, uh, tragic story. And uh, her mother, Rosamond Adukissi Deborah, um, got a second coroner's inquest to investigate Ella's cause of death because she couldn't understand why her daughter had died. And uh, what the coroner found and decided was that this air pollution exposure uh, was one of the three things which had killed this nine-year-old girl. And that is the first time that we have seen air pollution exposure on a death certificate. And the reason that it's quite difficult to uh, um, uh, find out is because you have emissions from vehicles or chimneys it mixes up in the air. You then get human exposures, health impacts, for example, like asthma, and then you get death outcomes. So there's a long chain of sort of uh, pollution here and then the final outcome. And the outcome is usually down to asthma um, or heart attacks or strokes. Uh, but in Ella's case, because of the diligence and the, the, um, the hard work of her mother, Rosamond, they were able to prove this link the air pollution exposure was one of the factors killing this little nine-year-old girl. Yeah, so I think you know, um, we're coming up, uh, it now, now is almost exactly 70 years after the Great Smog, uh, which killed about 4,000 people in a few days in London uh, in 1952. Now, at that time, uh, people had a very simplistic view of air pollution. 
So they were worried about respiratory effects, breathing effects, um, from short-term exposure to very visible coal or wood smoke. Um, that was what people were concerned about. Um, and it was only in the mid-1990s that uh, studies looking at whole cities, uh, six cities in the States, um, looking at many different factors, found that actually long-term exposure to air pollution cured as many people as these short-term episodes. And most of those deaths from long-term exposure are from heart attacks and strokes. Now, of course, things have moved on again. Um, there's been some uh, tremendous research in the UK, uh, which has um, uh, you know, proved the link between you know, um, uh, air pollution and lung cancer, for example. But the more scientists look, the more they find. You know, we're now hearing about uh, unborn children with air pollution in their bodies. Um, uh, we worry about cognitive effects, genetic effects possibly even affecting people's IQ. So um, air pollution affects everybody to some extent at every stage of their lives. And so what we need to do is reduce air pollution, and that's about local air pollution, and it also relates to climate change, which is reducing the greenhouse gases. Yeah, so in London, for example, we have a mayor who is passionately committed uh, to reducing air pollution, uh, Sadiq Khan, and he really has done a, a good job. So uh, by um, highlighting the problem, so what I call sort of building public understanding of the dangers of air pollution and giving people advice about how they can um, protect themselves and reduce pollution for themselves and others, it is possible to make progress. So the mayor has um, made action on uh, uh, transport, road, road transport, um, really one of his priorities. And that's partly from uh, the expansion of the ultra low emission zone, it's partly from more electric buses, um, and it's also by a move um, to electric taxis, which are another source of pollution. And it's also, of course, by promoting walking or cycling. So the key is to sort of push down on the bad things, you know, vehicle pollution, and encourage the good things like walking and cycling. Uh, well, the ultra-low emission zone, which um, the mayor has um, uh, introduced and extended in London, so this area wasn't part of it before, and pollution has come down as a result of being included. Um, uh, the ultra low emission zone is, is one of the best ways of, of tackling pollution because we want to tackle pollution at its source. But I would say that there are two different ways that the ultra low emission zone is effective. The first of course is it discourages the most polluting vehicles from going in the most polluted places. So that's a good thing. But what it's also done is send a very powerful signal um, that you shouldn't buy um, vehicles producing um, harmful emissions. So car showrooms in London haven't sold diesel vehicles for years because they knew that if they bought them, they might not be able to drive in this part of London or the other part of London. So yes, it tackles and discourages vehicles, particular vehicles from going in the most polluted places, but it has this much bigger benefit of discouraging people from buying these, these vehicles, polluting vehicles, in the first place. So uh, I'm very pleased that we have a low emission zone, an ultra low emission zone. I'm very pleased the mayor is proposing to expand it. And I think um, as a campaigner, uh, what I would say about ultra low emission zones is they always need to be bigger, they always need to be stronger, and they always need to be smarter. Um, and what I mean by smarter is that ideally, what we would have is what I call emission-based road charging, and that would charge people depending on how much pollution they produce, where they are and what time of day, so a mixture of different factors, rather than the ultra-low emission zone, which can be a little bit of a blunt instrument, hitting a whole area in the same way at any time of day. Um, it makes sense to introduce these ultra low emission zones, clean air zones, in the most polluted places. You know, it's a targeted 
measure. Uh, and I think what it is, um, uh, part of the story is about discouraging people from buying diesel vehicles. Um, so we have seen uh, some of these zones implemented around the UK, which has played a part in bringing down our nitrogen dioxide levels, this toxic gas. So for example, there were only uh, about 10 zones out of 43 in the UK last year that breached the legal limit, so we're still breaching the legal limit, but it was down to 10 um, last year, partly still through some COVID measures, but it was 10 last year compared to sort of 35 or 40 uh, a few years ago. Well, I think the most important um, thing, uh, I think, about fighting air pollution is to think of the air as one air. So a combination of local air pollution and greenhouse gases. What we need is zero air emissions. You know, that is what we need to protect public health, protect the environment and protect the climate. So that's the approach that we need to adopt. It is about a mixture of technology and lifestyle changes, by which I mean some bans, some charging, some incentives, you know, a range of, of measures. Um, but I think we need to build public understanding of the dangers of air pollution and give them advice about um, protecting themselves and reducing pollution for themselves and others, which is um, uh, about adaptation and mitigation in, in the climate sense. Um, so we need to do that, but all countries need to work together. COP27 is a very, very important uh, moment um, because it is about taking action at a global level uh, to fight air pollution of all sorts. Uh, combustion is about 80% of the greenhouse gases and local air pollution. We need to drive that down. Um, Korea has some good policies, but we need to move uh, in Korea, in London, in the UK, uh, really from combustion fuels um, to the use of renewables. Um, we need more energy efficiency, so buildings and vehicles consume less. Um, and that, of course, reduces the, the cost for people. So it is about, uh, I think, you know, urgent action to combine these technology measures and some lifestyle changes, which involve some bans, charges, and incentives so that people move away from the polluting um, um, activities that we've got.